Hi guys, how are you? So let me set this up. Um, all right, this is the very first video in the series that I'm going to make for microbiology. It'll help you review material. This is not a substitute for the lectures because obviously I'm showing you pictures. I'm interacting with you. There is no way I can interact with you guys here, right? So um, I'll try to um, um, do my very best to convey this information to you, but please remember that um, in-person learning is paramount, okay? All right, let's uh, not waste any more time. Microbiology, what is micro? Now, some of you are um, super mathematically gifted. Micro, 10 to the power of minus six. Yeah, it just means it's small. Micro is small. So when we say microorganisms, we mean bacteria, we mean viruses, we mean protozoa, we mean fungi, we mean all those little things that we need a microscope to see. Nothing fancy, small little things, okay? And um, a few other terms that you need to know are important. You need to know what epidemiology is. So microbiology is a study of microbiology, micro in small, bio life, logy. So it's a study of small life, right? Study of microorganisms, small organisms, which are bacteria, viruses, protozoa, or fungi. But what about epidemiology? Just break it down. Logy, study of epi, from above, demi. Demi means DM is people. Demos, democracy, right? You, you know the term democracy, the part, you know, the when the people rule, right? The rule of people. So epidemiology means that you're, it's a basically, it's basically a study where you look at people from kind of from above, okay? It's not like above meaning like, oh, I'm looking at you from above. Uh, no, it means simply you analyze the big picture. Look at people who live in the mountains. You say, oh, okay, those guys live in the mountains. Is there anything different about that population, the big group of people, right? Versus those that live, for example, um, at the seashore or those that are exposed to mosquitoes, unfortunately, right? So, and so on. So look at them, at the groups of people and you try to notice, is there any disease pattern that becomes obvious just by the virtue of being a part of that little community, whether it's a place or family or, um, you know, uh, other uh, uniting factors, okay? And you can, you can actually develop your own uniting factor. For example, those people that are under 20 years old that live in, um, uh, you know, uh, cities that have a population of more than 1 million, and so on, okay? So epidemiology, look at the populations, you look at groups of people from above and try to see, is anything more frequent in them? Frequency? Is there anything that, you know, is there, for example, a sexually transmitted disease that is more common in a certain population? What is the spread? Or any other disease, okay? Another logy that you need to know for your class is mycology, and that's the study of fungi. That's it, study of fungi, okay? So a um, few more terms, pathogenicity. Pathogenicity is very important. Gen means causes, pathos is a disease. So pathogenicity is a, um, is uh, an ability of a microorganism, and you know what it is, microorganism, the little organism, to actually cause a disease, okay? So this disease-causing microorganism is then call, called pathogen. Um, one thing that you have to be really careful about is not to confuse the term pathogenicity with virulence. So, an organism is either pathogenic or not pathogenic. It's like yes or no, okay? So you can't say it's very pathogenic. 
However, you can say it's very virulent. So different levels of being able to cause disease, that's virulence, okay? So different levels of virulence. Uh, an organism can be pa pathogenic or not pathogenic. If it's pathogenic, it may exhibit different levels of virulence. Some are very dangerous, like there are some bacteria, one, up, like 10 bacteria might be enough to cause uh, uh, diarrhea, for example, in case of Shigella. And then there are other bacteria that um, require thousands, like cholera, you need tens of thousands bacteria to actually cause diarrhea, okay? So Shigella and cholera are two bacteria that you may be seeing, that you may be seeing in the future, okay? Shigella and Salmonella both cause diarrhea. Shigella causes a bloody diarrhea. Um, a sal um, um, cholera causes rice water stew diarrhea. All right, um, so very briefly to naming of bacteria. Bacteria go by the first name and the last name. Only their last name goes first. That last name is called genus, genus, okay? First name is species. So, you know, in some cultures, like in the Chinese culture, um, they would be saying their last name first, and uh, first name second, okay? So bacteria and plants and every, um, all living beings are uh, um, um, organized um, with their genus capitalized, written first, and their species following that, okay? Now, species is a name that is given to a group of living beings that belong to the same genus, obviously, right? But that have similar characteristics. Let's, let's go for an example. So there is a bacterium called Staphylococcus, and we already talked about it last week, right? I said Staphylo means a bunch of grapes. Caucus are like tennis ball shaped um, um, structures, right? Like balls. So Staphylococcus, a bunch of grapes, right? So there is a bacterium that you know, it's called Staphylococcus aureus. What does aureus mean? Our aurum stands for gold. You know that AU, you probably had chemistry. AU is the, is the uh, symbol for gold. Atomic number is, um, I think it's 79, right? So uh, aurum stands for gold and... Um, Staphylococcus aureus is the aureus stands for the species, okay? And it denotes that, hey, it looks like golden color. It does have this golden color, aureus. Looks like yellow, looks like gold, looks like um, um, something that we can put, um, um, so, you know, something that we can recognize as a distinct structure, okay? So Staphylococcus aureus, aureus is the species, Staphylococcus is the genus, capitalized, written first. And uh, by the way, where is this Staphylococcus found? You know that it's found on the skin. That's its normal location. One third of us have it, right? Where is it found? In the no nostrils, the nares, behind the ears, axilla growing, and so on. But nostrils is well where they'll be uh, uh, mentioning um, um, you know, th that's what they like to ask you about. All right, let's do a little bit of history. Let's do a little bit of history. I don't want you to know too much of history. Now, obviously, hey, no one precludes you. Go ahead and read up all the, all the encyclopedias that uh, will give you even more information if you are interested. But if you are not so interested, and we all have different interests, right? Um, I, want, I want you to know three individuals, okay? One is a Dutch guy called Leeuwenhoek. One is a British guy called Jenner. And one is a French guy called Pester, okay? So Anthony van Leeuwenhoek died about 300 years ago. 
Jenner, Edward Jenner, died about 200 years ago. And Pasteur, Louis Pasteur, the French guy, was born about 200 years ago. Okay? So that's the timeline. So about 300 years ago, the guy who died 300 years ago, before he died, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, um, and I'm sure Dutch would pronounce his name differently, Leeuwenhoek or something like that. I don't speak Dutch. I do, I do understand a few words because I speak a similar uh, language. Okay, so um, Leeuwenhoek, he's essentially someone who started it all. He was the person started microbiology, right? He was the person that developed this crude microscope. It was just a, uh, a slab of metal with a lens stuck, like placed into it. And he had a screw on top, on, on, on top of which, uh, where, you know, which had a tip and he would call, he, he, he made it essentially like a stage. And so he could move it, place that little object that he put on the tip of that screw um, and put it into the, um, into um, just above the lens. And so he could magnify um, the object he was looking at, right? And what he discovered were microbes. And you know already, microorganisms are what? Bacteria, protozoa, fungi, worms, we call them helminths, and viruses. Obviously, he could not see viruses, right? But he could see some little something, and he called them microorganisms, okay? <clears throat> Remember that all those microorganisms that he saw are now classified, excuse me, as living beings. Microorganisms are, are classified as living beings. Viruses are not classified as living beings. Why? They can't reproduce on their own. They hijack the cellular machinery of um, humans or other animals or bacteria to reproduce. They infect us and, um, and um, they reproduce uh, not on their own, but they actually use the energy of the cell to make more of themselves, okay? So, um, so uh, what he saw were little beings and now, we uh, little microorganisms, and now we have come so so far um, that we know that what he saw were bacteria, and with compound and confocal and electron microscopes, we have seen so many more of those, and now we know bacteria, protozoa, fungi, helminths, viruses, are all those microorganisms. Okay. So, uh, Leeuwenhoek. Now let's move on to the guy who died 200 years ago. So Leeuwenhoek died 300 years ago and Jenner died 200 years ago. Okay, about, about, okay. And what he did and his claim to fame is that he actually developed the technique of immunization. What he did is, um, he realized that um, cowpox um, material taken from the skin could be given to humans and protect against smallpox. And you know, for, for current generation, that doesn't seem like a big deal. Hey, you know, vaccination, not a biggie, right? Except that smallpox at that time killed over 10% of the population, okay? So it was really deadly. So within a year after he uh, published his findings, that vaccine, and vaccine comes from the word vaca, cow, there you go, cowpox, right? Uh, so what he noticed is that, uh, Edward Jenner, that, um, 
those that work with cows and get cowpox don't get smallpox. And cowpox was not a biggie, essentially. I'm, I'm just making very simplistic, okay? Cowpox was not a dangerous um, uh, thing. Smallpox killed, okay? So he thought, hey, why not, why not um, take that material, infect healthy humans, and pre get them to get cowpox and make sure they never get smallpox. And he, uh, he even in, in, uh, infected his own little kid. Okay, at some point, not, not, he didn't take him as the first patient, but um, uh, that's what he did, okay? So he basically developed this technique of immunization. Although what is really interesting is that uh, okay, we'll, we'll not go into history, but um, uh, history is beautiful. People had noticed that using something where you get that uh, mini disease um, was actually preventive for the real disease. People noticed that thousands of years ago, but he was the guy who essentially showed it, okay, and uh, applied it. So we give him credit for that. Edward Jenner, the British guy who died 200 years ago, approximately, right? So um, then there was a guy who was uh, pretty much born about 200 years ago, okay? And his name is Louis Pasteur. He was a French guy. Um, what you need to understand is about 200 years ago, France was a major center of research, like, the United States was by far uh, the world leader in science right now, right? But, you know, about 200 years ago, France has, France, Germany, uh, uh, Britain had um, a big place in France, especially you will be studying Dillon Barre, you will be studying um, uh, many, um, many uh, French names, uh, Guillaume, for example, was a uh, French surgeon, uh, a neuro neurologist. Uh, Barret was one. Guillaume Barret's, uh, you know, th they basically defined, um, uh, you know, the disease and so on. There, there are many more, okay? Uh, but Louis Pasteur was one of them. Now, the funny thing is here, he was not a physician, a surgeon. Uh, he was a chemist, okay? And this shows to you that you really don't, you, you got to think straight. You know, what you do is um, not based on your um, formal education. Formal education is very helpful. Formal education is very important if you want to practice something. But to truly think, to truly know the subject, all you need to do is truly care about it and um, no weed coke, okay? Louis Pasteur had, had quite a few problems getting things done because he was not a physician, okay? But what he did is quite a lot, like amazing, okay? So, um, and let me start by, you know, um, let, let's not make it a particular timeline. Let's just play with his last name. Pasteur. All of you know the word pasteurization. It's on every single bottle of milk, right? So pasteurization is just decrease of pathogens, bacteria that may cause harm. In where? In milk. We know it mostly in milk, but also in wine, in beer, and so on, right? Don't confuse pasteurization where the number of bacteria is reduced so that the product lasts long enough with sterilization. So sterilization is absolute annihilation of anything you can destroy in terms of microorganisms, right? So sterilization is way more uh, than pasteurization. Pasteurization is just, you know, for example, there are many ways, but one of them is, for example, just heating very quickly to a very high temperature and then dropping it quickly so that you don't lose the uh, taste qualities of the product of food mainly, right? But um, you still ensure that 
uh, that particular um, item of food is going to be um, is going to last. Okay, so sterilization is getting rid of all the uh, microorganisms. Okay, um, you you got to know that there is a thing called autoclaving. You got to know uh, where you know you expose material to very, very high temperature, 123 degrees centigrade and humidity, right? Then there is dry heat sterilization, um, many others, super critical fluid sterilization. Um, just, just kind of be familiar with the names. Do no autoclaving. Autoclaving is not, it is uh, pretty common. Um, um, some of you may be, um, may have seen it already, okay? So pasteurization from Louis Pasteur, pasteurization. So every time you go to your store, look at that bottle of milk, think Louis Pasteur. Okay, the guy who was born 200 years ago, who we, um, who we credit for designing uh, that method. Okay, and his chemical uh, background obviously played a big um, role here. All right, but what else did he do? He basically uh, showed that you know, how did it come to um, develop pasteurization? He basically realized that bacteria that spoil, it's the bacteria that spoil wine. Wine is a big deal, right, for some. So, you know, it's, a, it's an item that was difficult to store. It was a seasonal item. Back then, you, did, you had grapes in summer, and um, you wanted to drink wine in winter. Well, didn't work very well. So this guy obviously um, resolved quite a few problems, right? Um, so he had this uh, swan-necked flask uh, where he essentially um, showed that it's not the spontaneous uh, generation in, in fermentation, but that uh, yeast was responsible. Okay, um, uh, for uh, wine spo spoilage. Okay, so, but he actually went way beyond that. He even uh, developed the immunization techniques for like rabies, um, 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 uh, anthrax, uh, cholera. And I told you, cholera bacteria, uh, you need a lot of them to cause damage, but hey, you know, back in the day when there were no refrigerators, um, people were very scared of cholera because um, at times cholera epidemics, you know, water was dirty, water cleaning system was not developed well. So you had, you know, you need a lot of those cholera bacteria to cause damage. But hey, you know what? If you, if you drink a lot of water, if, um, you know, it has... A lot of those bacteria, you may die uh, of uh, diarrhea. You lose so much water that you just die, okay? Um, so that's cholera, okay? Anthrax, cholera, uh, rabies, rabies, you need to know rabies for sure. You know, rabies is a very dangerous disease. Um, uh, the, the outcome is death. There is literally one person in the literature who has survived rabies without vaccination. One person in the literature. So it's most likely an, either an outlier or a, a wrong documentation. It's that deadly, okay? Um, all right, so that was Louis Pasteur, okay? And these guys um, enabled us to go and study cells, okay? And I told you, uh, right now, we're using, obviously, electron microscopes. We're using compound microscopes. Um, you know, um, um, so many different kinds of microscopes, right? But uh, what really matters is that they open the doors for us. There is always, it's not like these guys. Now, you have to understand, you know, we read about one particular person in science who um, is considered to be the father of... Um, the uh, particular branch, right? Most of the time, there are very few outstanding exceptions, okay? Most of the time, these are individuals who just 
were able to unite the, uh, the prevalent knowledge and just create something new, okay? Um, Elon Musk is today's scientist who is uh, doing crazy things, right? We have some more, but uh, he's, um, you know, that, that uh, superlative human being who, um, who is uh, just amazing, is doing so much for humanity, right? So, all right, let's talk about cells. Cell is obviously, the, and obviously, you know, this is a short lecture. Um, the intention is not to review cells in details. I'll just go over very, very few things, just so that you can follow me when I'm talking to you in class, okay? So cells um, are little structures that have a membrane. And I showed you in class, we all have membranes, right? We're all made up of cells. And all, all of those cells have membranes. Membranes are those phospholipid bilayers. It's just uh, fat, essentially fat, right? The phospholipid bilayers that can, that uh, encompass a certain group of molecules that are really well organized that can live on their own, essentially, right? So um, assuming they get enough food, nutrients, they can make their own energy and reproduce on their own. This is what is different. Um, um, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about viruses in a second. Okay? So uh, what does this cell membrane do? Well, it allows for waste removal. Uh, you know, you can, uh, so here's your cell. You know, it produces trash, waste, and it removes that waste, right? Cell is the boundary. So you, you need to throw it across the boundary. Right? Hey, give it to the neighbor. Don't, don't keep your own trash, okay? I'm just kidding, obviously, right? So, but hey, via that boundary is how you get food too. Be nice to your neighbors because you need some food, right? So allowing nutrients. So what does it do? that membrane allows for waste removal and allows for nutrients to enter the cell, okay? So what else does it do? It's a boundary, it protects the cell from the environment. Without that boundary, it's essential, you're, you're just opening up the gates. The, you can't contain anything. It actually is a container. It protects the cell from the environment, okay? Those are the functions of the cell membrane. But look at this. Does it have its own shape? And I told you in class, it does not. It does not. Okay. Remember what I told you. Cell wall. Look at the wall behind me. Cell wall has a shape. So if a cell has no cell wall, because every single cell has a membrane. Membrane is like a boundary. You, no membrane. How are you supposed to have that very structure, right? So... If you have a cell wall, you have a particular shape. If you don't have it, you, you don't have it. So membrane is not, cell membrane is not the reason for a cell shape. Maintaining cell shape is not one of its functions. So uh, what else? Um, um, so when we talk about bacteria, some bacteria and, and actually protozoa, okay? Some protozoa can change, you know, have internal machinery where they, um, let's say their, their cell shape is round. What they can do is they can create like a shape, change the shape of their cell, make it like wavy and, um, you know, um, and move that way, okay? So they kind of, a, kind of send a projection ahead and maybe grab onto something and move up, okay? These are called pseudopodia. Pseudo means fall, false. Pod means uh, from, the, from the term foot, so false feet. We actually have them in our body too. Um, you probably remember, uh, you probably remember your anatomy classes. Kidney has cells, right? That... Um, um, that uh, line the basement membrane, line the basement membrane 
and uh, ensure that you filter the material uh, before it can pass and form urine, right? So what are those three? Let's let's review a little bit of anatomy here. Let's read, maybe I should show you um, a picture. Let me see. Ah, uh, never mind. It's it's probably going to take too long. I'm, I'm um, you know, I'm um, going to make these. Um, uh, I'll try to focus on limiting this material. Okay, uh, just go and watch my videos uh, for uh, for anatomy. Okay, so uh, be, but but just to make sure, I kind of um, still um, um, help you remember that you have that glomerulus. Um, of uh, capillaries, the tuft of capillaries, right? That is contained in the Bowman's capsule. And uh, the glomerulus are the capillaries. So they have that endothelium, they have that basement membrane. What about the podocyte food processes that make up the, the Bowman's capsule, right? Podocyte, podocyte. They have part of their, uh, you know, food processes. See, they have those feet, feet around um, the structures, right? But what about macrophages, the big eaters? Do they change their shape? They do, they do. And that's where these pseudopod-like motion comes useful, okay? So some protozoa use these pseudopods for mobility. Bacteria in general use flagella for mobility. Okay, flagella is like a big tail, like a rat's tail sticking out. It can be one, can be many, it can be quite a few. The whole body of the bacterium can be covered with flagella, okay? So cilia, you know cilia are um, used by cell, by cells, uh, 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 like, uh, you know, some, some protozoa, but also where, where do we have cilia in our body? Uh, think of the airways, right? Airways uh, need... Um, have those hair-like projections. Uh, some cells in the airways have those hair-like projections and they beat in tandem to move the sputum up toward the pharynx, right? So uh, pseudostratified ciliated epithelium, right, of the upper airways. Um, okay, so um, obviously cilia, flagella, pseudopods are all it's all about locomotion, movement, right? Mobility. Now, um, so that was the membrane and the parts and, and that are attached to it, cilia and flagella, and what the membrane can do, protect from the environment, allow food in, allow food out, um, um, but not maintain shape. Cell wall does that, right? So that's the boundary, but what is the command and control center of the cell? Well, we call it the nucleus, the center, right? The nucleus. It's the command and control center of the cell. It controls all the cell's activities. And guess what? Bacteria don't have it. But they have something similar because what's the what is it inside the nucleus that really matters? Is it not the DNA? And it is, right? It's just that the nucleus is the DNA with a surrounding membrane, right? So um, that's the eukaryotes, the surrounding membrane. Bacteria are unicellular organisms that lack that nucleus. Do they have the DNA? They sure do. And where is this DNA like stored? Well, it's stored in a particular area that doesn't have that membrane. So what do we call things in Greek that look like something but are not? We use a uh, suffix called oid, oid. So nucleus looks like a nucleus, but is not a nucleus, nucleoid, right? Nucleoid. All right. So um, nucleoid is what prokaryotes, for example, bacteria have. Okay, that's their command and control system center. So what um, cells of eukaryotes have that DNA surrounded by a membrane and it's a double membrane um, and the structure is called nucleus, okay? 
inside that nucleus, there, there is a, a dense structure called nucleolus. Nucleolus participates in protein synthesis because that's where parts of ribosomes are made. And ribosomes, okay, so this is a nucleus and you always see a dot there, right? That's the nucleolus. And uh, it's, it participates in making ribosomes, but here is the deal. Ribosomes are actually found in both the eukaryotes, that's us, and the prokaryotes, that's the bacteria. What did I tell you? In eukaryotes, that's us, we have a boundary around that DNA, which we call the nucleus, right? That's the nucleus. And so that nuclear membrane is studded with um, um, uh, a ribosome. And off that membrane come, uh, come off the endoplasmic reticulum, ER. So when that membrane uh, forms that endoplasmic reticulum, and that endoplasmic reticulum is studded with the ribosomes. We call it ER that has ribosomes, ribosomal endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum with ribosomes, we call it RER, okay? Now, do bacteria have a nucleus? No, therefore they don't have endoplasmic reticulum. So if I ask you, do the bacteria have RER? You should be able to say, no, of course they don't because they don't have endoplasmic reticulum. Endoplasmic reticulum is an extension of the nucleus, right? Just, just uh, helping you to think, okay? One more, um, so ribosomes are very important for protein synthesis. And the last thing I want you to know about the cells is something pertaining to the um, um, mitochondria. You know that mitochondria are um, uh, organelles uh, where we make ATP, right? ATP is the money of the cell. It's um, what you use for cellular energy. So let's say I'm talking about a hard cell versus a skin cell. Which cell needs more energy? Hard cells beat lifelong all the time. Skin cells, you know, um, they, they do have certain activity, but they're not as active. So high energy heart cells, for example, would have more mitochondria uh, because mitochondria are um, uh, used for cellular energy, okay? So um, now let me jump, uh, uh, let, let, me, let me move on to staining of bacteria, okay? Something uh, you will do next week. Uh, you, you do need to know a few things. There is a stain called simple stain. Simple stain means what? It has only one color. Simple stain means what? You only take one stain, which has one color, obviously, and apply it, and that's it. So, you know, if it's green, uh, if the stain is green, your object looks green. If the stain is red, your object looks red, and so on, okay? So that is useful sometimes because sometimes what happens is that a particular organelle might label with that particular stain, right? But the rest of the material will not have any color because we essentially use those stains just to mark. Let's say I had something that, um, you know, sticks to all white shirts only. So if you wear like beige colored shirts, you don't, you don't, um, you don't pick that material, okay? Oh yeah, let, let's talk about, you know, there, there are, uh, you know, some, there are some, all of you that like to wear really, really dark colored items know that 
um, like like um, you know a jacket or something um, that picks um, dirt easily, you would know that um, if you pass a person wearing uh, uh, those fuzzy sweaters, um, well, not, probably you guys don't because it's it's probably only for those that did not grow up in this area, right? Warm jackets and etc. That's more like uh, elsewhere, but uh, to some extent, right? So uh, what happens is that you pick a lot of that uh, fuzzy material. Now, what if you are wearing something really light colored? You're not going to pick it, right? So that, think about staining pretty much like that. There are stains that bind to a certain part of uh, um, of a um, uh, cell, but not to the other. If there is only one color, we call it simple stain. It's not going to be help, uh, helpful if you want to say, is it this or is it that? Okay. To differentiate things, you need more than one stain. Okay. And um, to say it simplistically. Okay. And so um, there was this other scientist called Hans Christian Graham who designed a relatively simple technique to separate cells that have a thick cell wall, bacteria, wall, right? Wall means what? They have their own shape. Bacteria with a thick cell wall from those that have a very thin cell wall. Okay, we call it Gramstein to honor him. So note that finding out whether it's gram positive or gram negative is not used to determine uh, whether a bacterium is susceptible to a particular antimicrobial antibiotic. Okay, it can give you a direction, but it's not like a susceptibility test because you know some antibiotics should potentially kill a gram positive, for example, right? But what if you have other kinds of resistance? Then you don't. And we'll talk about resistance in a few, okay? So Gramsin is not a susceptibility test to determine microbial susceptibility to antibiotics. But what it's really good to um, for is just to say, hey, is gram positive or gram negative? And we'll, we'll see the use later on, okay? Later on. So... First, let's talk about how you do a gram stain. It's really easy. I know some of you like read it and get confused. Let me tell you, there for just for memory, this is a memory trick. There are two dyes and therefore two steps. For you, two dyes and therefore two steps. There is one step where you make all cells blue. And there is a second step where you make all cells red, okay? So there is one blue dye and there is one red dye. That's the principle of gram stain. Remember, it's a differential technique. We want some cells to be blue. We want some cells to be red, okay? So what's the name of the dye, the color, coloring agent that, um, that um, so let, um, what, what's the name of the dye that uh, makes everything blue? Literally everything. It's called crystal violet. How do you remember it? I already told you in class, violet, blue, and purple. That's the same color, essentially, right? For you, it's just a memory trick, remember, right? Gram positives are always blue or purple, whatever you want to call them, okay? So... And then there is a uh, there is another dye called saccharine. There, there, there are some other dyes that you could use, but let's just talk about crystal violet, which is the blue dye or violet or purple, whatever you want to call it, and saccharine, which is the red red dye. Okay, saffron um, like color, so orangish, uh, reddish color, right? So uh, the saffron is actually a food additive. You you add it to like. Rice, um, um, Italian food uses a lot of it. So um, you make the cells either red or blue, blue or red. 
in between, you have a few other steps. One, that that is of relevance. Actually, two that are of relevance, okay? So now, let me go over the steps first. Uh, I'll just name them, okay? Crystal violet, you add it. Um, then you add iodine, okay? Then you add alcohol acetone. Then you add, add uh, saffron. Okay, here's what happens. When you add crystal violet, it goes into the cells that have been fixed on that slide, makes everything blue, everything. All the cells that are on the slide blue, okay? Why do you add iodine? Iodine, they call it a mordant, but it's just a trapping agent. Okay, what it does, it, it makes an iodine crystal violet complex. So I, this is your crystal violet. Iodine makes it larger. So it's, it's, so it's retained in the cell a little bit easier, okay? So crystal violet iodine is one step for you. The first step, which makes everything blue, okay? So, so you've, made, um, you've made that first step and everything is blue. Well, what's the purpose? To be able to differentiate which ones are gram positive, which ones are gram negative. Here is what you do next. You take that slide and dip it in alcohol. And when you do those cells with very thin membranes, uh, or, sorry, with very thin cell walls, just lose all of that crystal violet plus iodine complex and become colorless, okay? Colorless. So when you add saffronine, or when you take that slide and dip it in saffronine, what happens is that those cells that just lost their color become red, that's it. So first you make everything, you take that slide, uh, take that slide, dip it in the, in the um, um, crystal violet. Okay, think of it as dip it in crystal violet plus iodine. Dip it into crystal violet, right after that you dip it into iodine. Um, Everything is blue, right? Then you dip it in alcohol or acetone, alcohol. Let's, let's just say alcohol, okay? Some cells lose the color, some cells still remain blue, okay? Then you dip them in the red color, the saffronine dye, those that lost their color, that are colorless, are now red. So now on the slide, you have blue slide. And those that are blue, they still remain blue. Why? That red color is not going to um, be more obvious than the blue one. So you still see the blue color, even though red dye is in those blue cells, right? So it doesn't matter to us. So you see red and you see blue. You see blue and you see red. Um, that, that's, um, so, um, ju just think, okay, adding crystal violet, crystal purple, crystal blue, whatever you want to call it in your mind for memory tricks, right? And iodine during gram stain. So let's say crystal purple, P, purple, gram positive are purple, okay? Or blue or violet, whatever, whatever you remember better. I remember blue better. So remember, iodine is a mordant, it's a trapping agent. Okay, so think crystal violet iodine. On one hand, think saffronine, the red color, saffron, food additive, food dye on the other, okay? Now, this is a simplification of um, dyeing procedure. To be honest, there is a lot of washing involved in, uh, you know, you actually, what you do first, you wash in water, you, uh, wet the dried bacteria on the slide. Stick them in water, take them out. Add crystal violet, stick them in water, take it out. Add iodine, uh, stick in water, take it out. Add alcohol very quickly. Stick in water, take it out. Add saffronine, stick in water, take it out. You got your final result. Then you see the blue and the red, okay? All right, so uh, alcohol acetone is just a decolorizer. It gets rid of the, uh, of the blue coloration 
from the gram positives, right? Uh, sorry, so from the from the cells that have a thin cell wall, that would be gram negatives. Gram negatives with an N have no color, no color, okay? And saffronine just labels the gram negatives red. Here uh, is something that you need to remember, uh, not just for this class, but also when you go to core and to the hospital, there is a thing called LPS, lipopolysaccharide. A part of that lipopolysaccharide, which is found in the outer membrane of the gram negative bacteria. So, you know, all the cells, protozoans, have a cell membrane, and then around it is the cell wall, right? And it so happens that there is a group of cells that have a cell membrane, cell wall outside, but outside of that very thin, usually, cell wall. They have one more membrane, and we call it outer membrane. Just double membrane, not a nothing fancy. Don't like, ooh, that's tough. No, there's one membrane in most things that we know, like cells, us, right, eukaryotes. But those have two membranes. What's the big deal? Not difficult to remember. Okay, and that outer membrane has a thing called lipopolysaccharide, LPS. You're gonna read it there is a and um that lps is an n dotoxin n dotoxin is found in n is found in the membrane outer membrane of the gram negative bacteria only only okay so it's a part of the outer cell membrane of gram negative bacteria and lipid a is what makes that stat component that is the most relevant. That is the source of all evil, lipid A, okay? And I'll not go into detail what it means, but just remember, gram-negative bacteria have a cell membrane like we all do. They have a very thin cell wall, and then on top of that, they have another outer cell membrane, okay? That outer cell membrane has that thing called LPS, lipopolysaccharide, lipo fat, Holy many saccharide. It's just a chemical formula that we recognize now that causes havoc in the body if let loose. Okay. And lipid A is just a part of that LPS because you will hear that term lipid A. It's a component of gram negative cell membrane, the outer cell membrane. Okay. Um, just to clarify, some bacteria, so, so lipopolysaccharide with that lipid A component is a part of that cell membrane, the outer cell membrane, right? But some bacteria, you know, go to bathroom, quotations, right? And um, produce toxins. So lipopolysaccharide, we call it endo inside toxin. But what if a bacterium just go, goes to bathroom, releases excretes, excretes, like ex excreta, right? <coughs> Sputum, feces, you, you know, excreta. Excrete some protein into the surrounding. The right term is obviously secretes. Let's just remember it. Excretes like feces. Okay, we call it exotoxin. Here is a bacterium, okay? That's your exotoxin, whatever comes off the bacteria, okay? Exotoxin secreted from the bacterial cells into the surrounding, okay? Uh, that's different. Do not confuse N-dotoxin, the gram-negative, N, 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 dotoxin, gram-negative cells, outer membrane. Exotoxin is something that is excreted, thrown out of the cells. Endotoxin stays in that membrane. It's part of the membrane. It's only released when the cell dies. And that's why we should be very careful about killing some gram-negative bacteria with that uh, lipopolysaccharide, the endotoxin 
in humans while they're in humans. We want to like kill them carefully. Okay. So um, just an important factoid, you, you know, gram stain cannot be used on everything. We can use it on most gram positives, uh, on all gram positives, gram negatives, pretty much, uh, you know, we, we defined it bacteria by, by the staining, right? But there are a few bacteria that are difficult to gram stain. You know, we will, we will do a bacterium called um, Gardnerella vaginalis. It's part of, it's a pretty much a normal flora that goes awry, ca causing bacterial vaginosis in um, ladies, right? Not a sexual transmitted disease, just an aberration, abnormality of the vaginal flora. So if we take those bacteria when they're very young, they have a very thin bacterial wall. And so they don't label with gram stain. They're not gram positive. But then when they grow up, they develop a thicker layer of um, the cell wall, peptidoglycan, and now they're gram positive. So we have bacteria like so, gram indeterminate, difficult to uh, label with gram stain. Or for example, mycobacteria. Mycobacterium does not have a cell wall made of peptidoglycan. Its cell wall is made up of mycolic acid. You cannot stain it with gram stain because of that mycolic acid, which is a glycolipid, okay? It's a lipid, which has a lot of sugar. So all those um, fat molecules are connected to sugar in some way. Protein molecules, glycoprotein glycolipid. Just remember, whenever you see the term glyco, it means sugar, glucose, glyco. Okay. So glycolipid, a type of a glycolipid is mycolic acid of the tuberculosis bacteria. What is the genus of tuberculosis bacteria? Mycobacterium. What is the species written second? Genus capitalized written first, Staphylococcus aureus. We talked about it at the beginning of this part of the lecture. Staphylococcus, capitalized S, uh, aureus means yellow, right? Golden color. Okay, so mycobacterium tuberculosis is a bacterium that is very important. Um, you know, the biggest killer of all, still in some, you know, in quite quite a big um, swaths of Earth. Okay, not. Not an issue here in the US, okay? But um, certainly something that we're very afraid of because it's very hard to treat, multi-drug resistant. Many, many drugs don't act on it. So you need combinations that are really, really challenging. Sometimes even those are ineffective, okay? So mycobacteria and tuberculosis cannot be stained with gram stain because of this mycolic acid. And so we use a stain called acid fast. Okay, acid fast. Remember, acid fast is just a, you know, um, it, it's, um, um, it's a way to stain. So mycobacterium is acid fast. It means, um, you know, it's fast. It doesn't um, get, um, um, just remember mycobacteria are acid fast. I, I don't want to go into details. Okay. Basically, they're resistant to acid alcohol. Um, they cannot, you know, they retain that dye. Um, um, and um, so these mycobacteria, contrary to what you read, are actually gram positive because remember crystal violet plus iodine, the dye at higher concentrations does go in, labels it blue, but that's not how you do it. Normally, if you were to do it, it it's not the right way to label it. So it's not gram positive, okay? So um, remember, acid fast is not, is just acid fast stain is how you label mycobacteria. Okay, just remember that. All right, um, I'll, I'll end this part right here. Um, and um, part two on the way.